You know, it's really hard to do the section after lunch. Yeah, so kudos to the companies after lunch. This is a test session, which is, means that we put some of our best speakers on the after lunch session to get everybody's blood pumping again. And I am so thrilled to have for our afternoon session, number one, our White Hat co-chair, Mara Aspinall, come on up from Illumina Ventures, and hot off the plane from DC, my dear friend, Nick Shipley. So come on up, Nick, Mara. I'm gonna let you guys take it from here. Perfect, thank you, Joan. It is um, great to be here. I, I have my white hat, but I'm, I'm just gonna leave it right there for a moment. And um, as Joan said, we are fighting the postprandial lows. So, um, and if you don't know what that means, go to a diabetes company and figure that out. Um, but the key here is we're going to be racing against your checking your email. So we're gonna try to make this interesting enough that you don't need to check your email for the next 42 minutes and um, have a conversation and give you a chance to ask any questions. So Nick, uh, should I, I'll start? Yes, please. Okay, so um, my background, I am very pleased to know many of you, and Joan would ask me to start with, I'm a member of the AZ Bio Board, but I do a few other things. Um, I'm a partner at Illumina Ventures, which is not um, the corporate VC of Illumina, Inc. Um, we were spun out from Illumina about 10 years ago, um, but we focus on genomics, diagnostics, devices, and a little bit of therapeutics. Before that, had the um, proud um, to say that I was co-founder of Bluestone Venture Partners, a small venture firm based in Arizona. And my colleague, Chris Burwell, is here. Most of my career has been in diagnostics, um, president and CEO of Ventana Medical, now Roche Tissue Diagnostics. Before that, um, president of Genzyme Genetics. And I'll add one more thing, which is I had the chance to run a startup called Oncuity, and um, it's failed. We were the first um, post J&J &J circulating tumor cell company. Um, back then we raised $26 million and we thought that was an enormous amount of money. And I say that it failed to remind me about how tough it is for all of you entrepreneurs um, to build a company. And I had the best team and best technology and great board and all of that, and there was no way um, we were just not successful. And I think you can learn more from your failures than from your successes. Um, and then lastly, I'm a professor of practice at Arizona State University and co-founder of the Biomedical Diagnostics Master's Degree Program at ASU. So speak to me about that afterwards. Um, as we start this, Joan knows I always start with a question. And I'm going to ask Nick, is your, you have your background and your question, which is tell everybody something very few people know about you. And I'm going to start with the fact that I have what I believe is the largest collection of Oreo cookies. <laughs> and Oreo cookie memorabilia. So if you know a museum that would be interested in modern art, I have about 800 pieces now of cookies. My husband calls it stale cookies from around the world. So with that, over to you, Nick. How, how old is the oldest cookie? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> About 25 years old. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty stale. Yeah, but, but you know what? They taste exactly the same. <laughs> it's kind of the, the, the Twinkie effect. That's, yeah, yeah. that's probably from the power of biotech right there. <laughs> in there. Um, well, great to be here. Thank you, Joan, for inviting me. Um, thank you for, it's not up there anymore, but using my old LinkedIn picture where I had more hair. Great. <laughs> I love it. Um, anyway, I, uh, I, my background is on the, uh, the government politics and policy side. I was a staffer on Capitol Hill um, for just shy of eight years. Uh, and then I left the Hill, went into uh, um, kind of multi-client government affairs work, which is a fancy way of saying lobbying uh, for, for many of the uh, um, kind of bio and pharma companies, as well as uh, um, kind of provider companies. I was doing uh, um, physician provider groups as well at that time. Uh, went in-house to pharma, the proverbial big pharma trade association, then spent some time at bio, uh, the biotech uh, innovation organization, which has a lot more of the smaller companies as well, pre-approval, uh, pre pre pre-commercial, uh, and then recently went back out onto the private consulting side again, uh, which is where you find me now. Um, I don't have 
nearly as good of an answer to my, my one thing question. The only thing that comes to mind since we, we were outside looking at the basketball arena was one, once upon a time, I got to play basketball with the Harlem Globetrotters. Uh, Whoa. It convinced me that I was going to be the next basketball star. <laughs> A painful moment when you uh, stop growing and just reach a perfectly average height and can't <laughs> jump at all. Um, but for a while there, it was going to be great. It was going to be awesome. Um, but anyway. Well, can I ask, did you have any videotapes of that? Because I would like to see this. Uh, the problem is that if, if they exist, they are probably actual videotapes, uh, <laughs> which I don't know if anyone could play, even if I could, could find it again. Uh, this was obviously when I was much, much younger, uh, and uh, VHS, still, still very much a thing uh, okay. that it is not any longer. Um, but uh, it was, uh, you know, just a, a, a rare, rare career turn on the, on the way to the NBA. Very me. cool. So, um, well, anyway, I, I know uh, we're here. This is an investor conference. We're um, maybe just to set kind of a framing, I'll ask you the next question, which is just to give us a little bit of your sense of what is the state of venture capital, the state of, uh, of where the industry stands on that, uh, and we can go from there. Perfect. So I'm going to start, I, I will call it the have and have nots. But when I talk about that, it's not just the firms themselves. I mean, not, not just the portfolio companies, but the venture firms themselves. What we have seen happen is so many of the smaller firms, frankly, have disappeared. They can't raise their second or third fund. They raised a bunch during the go-go years in the early aughts, or um, have now, they raised some money during COVID, and all of a sudden we see a tremendous consolidation where firms are raising two and three and four billion dollar funds, and then lots of other firms are raising 10 or 15 million, and that's it. So um, from the venture firms itself, and I'll focus on clearly on life sciences, mm -hmm. Um, but maybe more important to this audience is the importance of um, what's happening in terms of funding companies. And you know, if we had charts, you would see the, the bubble that happened during COVID. The early bubble during COVID was diagnostic firms, the late bubble was vaccines and therapeutics. And what we're seeing now is it's a very, very tough environment. Um, series A's are being cut in half down rounds for the first time that I can remember are more than 60% of all the rounds being done. So it's, it's almost like the whole industry took a step back and maybe a deep breath and said, we're, we're really challenged. That being said, the best of companies are definitely being funded because the venture folks also took a break and many of these larger funds haven't deployed all of their money and really need to get it out there. So I would say in therapeutics, we're seeing the best of the best um, get a fair amount of money, but they're being flipped faster. In diagnostics, it's still a desert. It is still going very, very slowly. And in life science tools and devices, somewhere in between. But we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it in terms of the exit piece. But I do see both parts of the industry as this have and have nots. But do you see it the same way from your vantage point? You know, it's I, I do think you see a lot of that, and I'm coming from the the Washington DC, Washington DC end. Um, you do read a lot about what I would call these really big, you know, firms funds that are that are doing well. Those headlines are what policymakers on the hill see, and then hmm. they, they look at us and say the industry is fine. They, yeah, you know, yeah. they're like, look at this. I read about this this uh, you know GPL one obesity thing. That looks like it's pretty good. <laughs> What's uh, um, don't tell me the industry's struggling. So it's it can be really hard to convince policymakers that there is um, a contraction in a lot of in a lot of cases, and there are a lot of policy headwinds. Uh, you know, um, we're all obviously t uh, aware of the move that the Fed made at the kind of macroeconomic level, but there are these policy headwinds um, that. I think the industry is still dealing with, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act is, is pretty well known, I, th I think, in the uh, kind of therapeutic drug side, the limitations and price controls that got put in place there. Um, but there's also a ton of, uh, of challenges on the payer reimbursement side with the uh, pharmacy benefit managers, PBMs um, are out there. Uh, and I think intellectual property can sometimes also get uh, kind of overlooked in this. And I, I cite these things, and I'm using the kind of acronym soup here, but it really emphasizes how, mu how many different pieces of this industry have a direct connection to 
government policy to government plans. Medicare and Medicaid are really big payers. Uh, you know, the patent office gives you your, your IP, which, you know, is kind of your lifeblood. Um, so I just think that there are all these challenges out there that can be really easily glossed over, and it's really hard for policymakers to kind of understand all the impacts when they just see, you know, that big ticket headline that yeah. told them everything was fine. So that is fascinating in terms of the sort of the, the perception versus reality. Do you see the government spending more time and energy in this industry? And we, we didn't talk about this, but you know, last week the Biosecure Act, which essentially within 10 years stops all, well, stops the easy import of Chinese goods. Um, where do you, do you see the federal government getting more involved going forward or less involved? I mean. I would say, my, my, the easy answer would probably say more involved, but I think that undersells how involved it already is. Hmm. You, know, you know, between you know, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, the ACA plans, the VA, uh, you've already got um, the government is, is in some form or fashion is one of the biggest payers on the reimbursement side that's out there. If you're in, you know, uh, Biopharma, you've got to get approval with the FDA. There's a chance you're doing a public-private partnership with the NIH. You've got, you know, CDC as a role, VA as a payer, et cetera. Um, there's just so much already there um, that it's hard to imagine what it means to be more involved. I always say more just because this is an industry that, for better or worse, um, is really in, uh, inexorably you know, involved with the with the government. Uh, you mentioned the Biosecure Act. Um, it's it's the, the tensions between the U.S. and China yeah. are, are very real. They have very real policy consequences. I don't, I don't know if the Biosecure Act it, it passed the House. We'll see if it gets all the way into, into law. Um, but it's a really good example of you know, where this, you know, these, these U.S.-China tensions, which might not immediately be the front of everyone's mind when it comes to our industry, but they have a very real impact. They, you know, they, they yeah. really do. Um, you know, have these, uh, we, we have a global supply chain, and it is very much, uh, you know, looking at China as probably the second biggest, second most important market yeah. for most of the companies. Like, it's a really big deal. It, it, I'll say from the pan, during the pandemic, there was no way we could have created the tests volumes or even come close to it without using the supply chain in China. It, you know, nitrocellulose, which are the, you know, the strips as part of the home testing, 80% of that came from Chinese manufacturers, maybe 70%, 30% from Europeans. I mean, it was really tough to do without it. So I think this is a sea change. Yeah, I think if it goes through, if it goes, I think even if it doesn't go through, there's you. You hear a lot of this in uh, when I talk to different government affairs office for for some of the bigger companies that have you know their global supply chain set up, is that they need to de-risk their supply chain. They need to find ways. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily going to pull out of China. You know, that's like I said, it's a really big market. It's really important. They, you know, there's there's tons of investment there. But maybe you're setting up parallel supply chains. Maybe you're finding some uh, duplication that's there. You know, companies that have the resources to, to do that, that's, you know, maybe it's a pain, maybe it's an annoyance, it's not, you know, ideal. I think the smaller and mid-sized companies could really get pinched there. Maybe you don't have the resources to build two whole supply chains yeah. uh, in concert, and I think that can be a real challenge. Um, it's, you know, it, it could always swing back the other way. Tensions could, could ease. It doesn't seem like that is going to happen anytime soon, but... Um, you know, that, that's certainly something you could, you could see out there. Uh, we're going to have a new administration one way or another. Um, they could take a different approach to China. They could take a different approach to the whole uh, solution. Because I think one of the things that gets lost and you're kind of emphasizing is that China just has a manufacturing volume, yeah. even if it's super inefficient. It, it is just a volume that's hard to compete with and hard to deal with, and that really exacerbates a lot of these problems. Yeah, and I, I'll just circle around this one last point here. You know, hopefully, it, it, well, good or bad, um, it probably increases the strength of U.S. manufacturing, and in Arizona in particular, a lot of our new jobs are manufacturing because we have space and we increasingly have a great student population and people want to move here. So from that perspective, it may actually be good for Arizona, but we'll see. 
I actually think there is a great opportunity um, economic development wise for places like Arizona. You kind of saw a version of this with the CHIPS Act, which had a, a yeah, exactly. Arizona exactly. as well. I don't want anyone to be, don't, don't misinterpret this to mean that I think the federal government's about to give the biopharma industry $200 billion. I don't, I don't know how this, <laughs> the semiconductor guys, hats off to you, you got it. We're, you know, I don't, I don't We're not know. quoting you. I don't, yeah, don't, don't, don't count on that windfall coming this way. But I do think there is this idea that, hey, we do need to make sure we've got some, some sort of critical supply chain infrastructure here in the U.S., and we don't have that now. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's probably going to take some level of, of subsidy to actually pull it off. We'll see if the government's willing to do that. Um, but that is something that is an opportunity when you're looking at places like Arizona trying to sell and talk about the economic development and growth that can, can happen here. I think the university infrastructure that's, uh, that's here is also kind of a, a part and parcel of that. Um, anytime I talk to anyone in the university community, I always ask them about their tech transfer rules. It's a huge, hugely important part of that. Um, it's something that uh, just can't be, be understated. Um, may, maybe just thinking of that in Arizona as a, tra as a transition, um, you know, we're talking a lot of federal, even a little international. States are increasingly involved in healthcare. Yeah. They're, where, whereas once upon a time, states might have said, oh, that's the federal government, interstate commerce, don't need to get involved in that. I don't think they do that any, anymore. What's, you know, what's your feel on that? I know you've been very involved in, in some of these efforts. So I would I'd love to hear what you're, what you're seeing. Well, I think um, most importantly, we're seeing states get much more involved in healthcare. Uh, in part, I think it's because of so many innovations over the last decade or two, is state legislatures really had to learn. Was biotech a scary thing? Was biotech advantageous to their state? Uh, is biotech something that they want to bring into their state? And as a result, we're getting what I think is the positive to that. And I'll, I'll use one example. Um, which are the state biomarker bills. And as of just last month, 20 states passed a bill um, that said if a patient, if the, a physician asks for a biomarker test to be done on a patient, the, any insurance company in that state must reimburse that and must allow that patient to get that test. That is huge for many of your companies, as I saw today. And this isn't just cancer. This initiative was started by the American Cancer Society's Cancer Action Network five years ago. And they said too many patients um, are missing out on true personalized medicine because the biomarker is not getting paid for. And don't start me on the fact that most of these biomarkers are three or $400 and they regulate drugs that are $30,000. No offense to the drugs, but let's get the test done um, first. And the American Cancer Society was quite quiet about it. And all of a sudden, in the last two years, it has exploded. About 60% of the American public is now covered in the states that have biomarker bills. This is tremendous. Now, they all started going to effect in the beginning of 2024. I believe that there'll be nine more states before the end of the year. So we'll be close to 30 states have these bills. And you say, are these bills really important? Well, let me go back a generation, which is in vitro fertilization, IVF. Um, I'm old enough to remember a, when IVF was invented, but um, states and state uh, health plans wouldn't pay for it and private health plans wouldn't pay for it. And the way they became standard are a, a state mandate telling all the insurance companies, you have to pay for one, two, three, four cycles. I think average now, they have to pay for three. So I think that this is a sea change. So that's a positive. Um, the negative is these bills don't say how much they need to pay. So could they pay $100 for a test that costs $200 to run in the lab? They could, and is the diagnostic company then obligated to do it? Maybe, the public companies in this space have not told their analysts how much they're gonna get from this because it's all new territory. But I think that's an example that never would have happened um, you know, a few years ago for states to wade into what was perceived as a niche in personalized medicine. And now it's very real. What else are you seeing from a state perspective? So I'm really glad we you're, you're told the, the biomarker story because it's such a positive story because I, I feel like on my end I deal with a lot more kind of 
negative stories on the on the state hmm. front. Um, so I got to take a, a slight disagreement, and this isn't every state, um, but one of the challenges that states have that the federal government the, does not is a lot of states require that they balance their budgets at the end of every year, yeah. and healthcare costs. Uh, they're high, they're expensive. And I, I think sometimes it's, it's really easy to kind of stick your head in the sand and pretend when you're on the kind of shoes that, I, that I'm in. Um, but I, I do think we've got to kind of talk about this head on. That has led a lot of states to scrutinize um, how they pay for healthcare. And this industry, the biopharma industry in particular, has seen some real uh, you know, negative policies coming on that. Um, there is what's called pre prescription drug review boards or PDABs, uh, you know, to throw another acronym on the table. That is basically a state uh, drug, a drug price control board. We've seen more states get involved in a program called 340B, which is like mm, this. Big deal. Yeah, it's a huge deal. You can tell how no one thought it was going to be a huge deal as it does not have a fun name like Obamacare. It literally just gets named after the part of the code that it's in. Public Health Service Act three, Section 340B is like, it's right there in the code. Um, they were like, it's only going to be 10 hospitals. Don't worry. Um, it's, it's bigger than, than uh, Medicare Part it's, B. It's, yeah. it's approaching Medicaid. Uh, it's, it's a massive, massive program. It's got one of those hockey stick growths. But now you have states getting involved in that space because they, um, they want to mandate that, uh, you know, that reimbursement goes through these kind of controlled processes. So I think there are a lot more challenges at the state level um, than we've had in you know, quite some time. I think you know, to go back to where I kind of started my original question was you, know, you had a lot of states defer to the, to the federal government yeah. and say, hey, you guys take care of this. The FDA is, is a federal program. Medicare is a federal program. Even Medicaid, it's a state federal partnership, but it's, you know, the feds set a lot of the policy. Uh, you've had, as polarization has increased, stop me if you guys have read this on the, in the op-ed section before, we're a very polarized country. There's been a lot of gridlock. Really? Yeah, you never, I, yeah. breaking news here. Um, that's, that's what you guys paid the big dollars for. <laughs> the, uh, but it also means Congress just doesn't get as much done. Um, you know, big health care bills over the last decade have all been when one, uh, one party has controlled the, the, what we call the trifecta, that's the, the House, the Senate, and the presidency, then they can pass a, a, a big bill. Most of the other stuff's kind of incremental, but that means that a lot of the states have kind of gotten frustrated waiting, and they have started to do more on their own. Well, that's what we see. And you know, the irony here is that if there were one area where there's some overlapping interest, it's actually health care. Not, not quite insurance and how it's paid for, but that's probably the best of what happens, and much less in other industries where there's no overlap in interest at all. I think that's right. And you did say something that I, I do think is worth pointing out, which I, I still think a lot of states view the bio, uh, biopharma, biotech industry in a positive way as an economic development driver, as a jobs driver, as a positive, you know, I, I have, spent a fair amount of time uh, on the government affairs side and every governor's office state has an economic development guy who's sitting there going, I'm going to build a biotech hub, I'm going to build a VC hub, I'm gonna, everyone's just going to move Man here. or woman. It's, it's, it's almost always men, unfortunately. Okay. Sad, sad, I, I, I'm trying. Sadly, sadly, <laughs> I, I hear you, I've, I've, been in, okay, uh, okay. I've been in this too, you know, a long time, but uh, in one day, in the, in the future. Be, we'll, we'll see better. Um, maybe, maybe I will attribute the simplicity with which they describe it to the fact that it is all men <laughs> in their more I didn't ask him to say that. Um, but, it, but it's true. Like they, they all look at this industry as a source of growth. They're, they're, they're half right in, in that kind of yeah. imagining. Sometimes they get a little pie in the sky where they imagine, you know, hey, company X, you're going to pick up your headquarters from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and just plop it down here in you know, the middle of some small town Phoenix. in Nebraska, Phoenix. Uh, you guys at least have, you know, you got, uh, you know, city, universities, workforce, et cetera. I've, I've dealt with some that are few, fewer assets in, in play and they still got the same dream. Um, I think the dream is where we, uh, where, where we as representatives of this industry kind of have to connect with, uh, with them. They, you know, have that positive exchange of ideas with those policymakers. I, I always, Joan has heard some version of this many times, I always encourage people from our industry to engage with policymakers because they play such a huge role in the industry. And economic development is one of the areas where we can universally engage in a positive way. Yeah. Um, this is, you know, these, these by and large it's jobs, good paying jobs. Uh, it's the type of, type of industry that, that states want in their backyard. Yeah, they're proud to have us there. So um, yeah. why don't we ask questions from the audience, if you have any questions.
because we, we can keep talking for two, three hours. Joan will throw us off soon, yeah. but no. right. You want to start? I can, I, can, I can start on this one, uh, you know, particularly on the, the point about policymakers. And I'll, I'll get back to something I just said about always encouraging engagement. You said there are, are no policymakers or very few policymakers that have started a business. I think right now there are no members of Congress that have direct experience doing a, you know, a, a biotech uh, startup. They, I, there used to be a rocket scientist in Congress. He retired, Rush Holt from New Jersey. Um, but now you're, 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 you're out of luck. I, and, but, but, Think, think about it, you're a member of Congress. Yesterday, you were a lawyer, you were a sheriff, you were a real estate agent, you won an election, boom, now you're in charge of Medicare policy for 80 million seniors, and that's, we, we probably shouldn't expect that they know what's going on in this space. Why would they know these things? We have to educate them, we have to talk to them, we have to engage. The worst thing we can do is find ourselves in a, too much of a defensive crouch. And I will, I will give you what I think is a positive story on that, particularly because you, you're, you're talking about the importance of the, the small company experience. Um, uh, Senator Cassidy from Louisiana. Louisiana's not a, some sort of gigantic, uh, you know, bio hub, uh, but he just last week introduced a bill um, to try to strengthen and expand the small uh, biotech exemption in the Inflation Reduction Act. It was an exemption that was in the, put in the bill. I, candidly, it's, it's not drafted well. You, like, it only counts if you introduced your product in 2021, which, you know, I don't know how you go back in time and get that going forward, but um, he wants to fix it. He wants to make it work. So there are, you know, members, policymakers, that when you engage with them, you talk to them, you, you hear it, they do act on these things. They do have good intentions to try to, to fix this. Um, so I do think it is, uh, it is worth doing. It is worth in, investing that time. Um, that's my take. And, and I'll take it now. That was great from the government point of view. I'll take it from the venture capital point of view. And I think that we, you know, I started with have and have nots and the dichotomy here. What we're seeing is um, fewer people focusing on um, series A and series B and more people emphasizing very early deals because of exactly what you said. You said fear is more powerful than greed. Um, in the early, early days, venture capital is trying to do both. So instead of just waiting for the deals to come to the firms, particularly the largest one, Flagship and Arch and Atlas, um, what they are doing is they are creating the companies themselves. Um, and as a result, they are taking a large percent of the equity going in. So if nothing else, they control the company. Now, as an entrepreneur, is that good or bad? You can argue it's bad because you've got one company driving uh, you know, decisions. You could argue it's good because it's more, these firms who have started their own companies have done disproportionately well. And they're not just getting two or three X, they're getting five and 10 and just recently there was a 90 X in terms of their return for these early stage companies. And so the venture investing has changed that way. I do think it makes the universities more powerful because a lot of this technology is not coming from somebody's idea that they created from whole cloth. It's coming because they're licensing it from the university and they're licensing that IP and the know-how and that lab, and then they're investing. So I can see the challenge because as a classic kind of seed company early on where you might have a little bit of technology from here, here, and here, the venture firms, some of the largest ones, are saying, we're only starting our own. We don't want to even hear your pitch. And that's a tough place to be. It's certainly not 100-0, but that mix towards the early stage has, has shifted significantly in the last five years. But you'll see companies, um, the venture firms, own a whole lot more of these companies than they ever have in the past. Often with the management team of founders, having a lot of money, but there's a whole lot less going into these perceived higher risk firms later on. Other questions? I mean, I don't, I, I will say, I, I personally in my travels in DC don't hear a ton about, about Mexico. You know, they just, uh, not too long ago, um, had uh, a renewal or a, um, 
I forget how they finally put it, but when, when Trump tore up NAFTA and they recreated USMT, it was basically the same treaty all over again with minor tweaks. Um, that was probably the last time we heard significant um, you know, talk about, about Mexico. I, it just doesn't have the same resonance, whether that's because the volume is not there or because the tensions between uh, the US and the country setting aside immigration discussions, um, but they, aren't, they just aren't in the same category as, as, as China. Um, when they t people talk about supply chain in DC, they're, they're talking about China. And I'll, I'll give you the, the Arizona perspective that many of you know. Um, Mexico plays a big role. So the former ambassador of Mexico is going to be in Tucson next week. Um, one after another, there's a lot more cross-border cooperation. Um, not nothing like the tension, again, separate from immigration, particularly on the towns on the border. I live in Tucson. You don't feel any of that tension. Um, a lot of our supply chain for the largest companies, not only in biotech, but I'll stick, stick with life sciences, are from Mexico and have a number of facilities right across the border. So there's actually a very positive relationship. The consul in Tucson is a very active place where lots of meetings happen and lots of exchange. At the universities um, all over the state, there are a lot of students coming in and a lot of exchange programs both ways, but clearly not typical of the rest of the, the country. But I expect in each of our governors, regardless of parties um, and many of the mayors, have emphasized the importance of working with Mexico. We just don't, I, I would say we don't have a choice. They're too close. I mean, We're I too would, close to them. Yeah, I would also, and, and I, I, I would echo almost what you're saying, is like it, and it, I would say it's, it's probably great that you're not hearing about it in the DC context. When you hear about it in the DC context, it usually means there's a problem. So like if you're dealing with yeah. it in a nice, you know, ni functional. Nice way, a functional way, that's good. Don't, you know, <laughs> don't so, rock the boat. <laughs> boy, so, sign my NDA plate here. <laughs> yeah. So when you go back to uh, DC, don't talk about how well it's going here. Guys, you heard about this? <laughs> Um, last question, and then maybe we should end on what we see for the industry going forward. Joan? Uh oh. I don't know <laughs> so you want to start. I don't which one going to go first. There is. Um, Rock, paper, scissors. Yeah. So, I, I, without dipping into too much of a political discussion, I would say. Generally speaking, tariffs aren't great. Um, they are just usually, it, it, maybe it's just as simple as that. There, there is not a good way to create an, a, a, a vibrant, dynamic innovation ecosystem and then take parts of it and apply sometimes heavy tariffs, whether you do it by product, by region. Um, it almost inevitably ends up with uh, exemptions needing to be piled on immediately, which this, uh, this industry in particular has a lot of experience with. There's a lot of exemptions that are, are written in for uh, healthcare, uh, medical products, um, and that sort of thing. So I, I think by and large, regardless of who's putting them on there, tariffs are, 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 are just usually not a great solution for us. Yeah, and, and I'll just say I agree. I mean, I'm a globalist, if that's, if that's the right word for it. We have to be able, you know, each country has to be able to compete, but tariffs coming in and tariffs going out, it, it's impossible to do them fairly. The problem is we don't control the whole world, we, if we're going to say the US. So we get huge tariffs going into other countries, and then we feel like we need to um, you know, right that situation and balance it. So I think it's a really awkward piece. But you bring up a good point. You know, as a layperson, not knowing what you do about Washington, it, it's often just about the headlines. And there are so many exceptions behind it, it actually doesn't change anything. Yeah. Um, so it's for political good as opposed to product good. Um, but it doesn't mean it's easy to get around, particularly for small companies who don't have the political power to get in the senator's office to say, my product isn't covered by that exemption, let's make sure to do it. And, and I'll leave it, you know, one of the pieces, and, and um, Joan didn't ask me to say this, but one of the reasons that it's so good to be part of AZ Bio and Bio and, and or Pharma or the diagnostic companies is to understand what's happening to your industry in a broad way. 
because for most of the small companies, no way you can afford somebody in Washington or, or even have the time, even if you had the money. And so to be able to work with these trade associations is absolutely critical, if nothing else, to know what's coming. And that becomes critical because my, my fundamental belief is no surprises, <laughs> which that's right. doesn't always work. Yeah. Speaking, of, speaking of surprises, what, what, what do you predict? How do you feel about the industry for 2025? Um, I'm bullish on biotech and not just GLP-1s, um, although there was some <laughs> very interesting data just today that came out that said oral G GLP-1s, which I think will ultimately replace injectables. Um, has amazed 10% 10, 10 weight loss in eight weeks. I mean, extraordinary. Um, so I am bullish on biotech. I am bullish on genomics. I think that we're entering this new era of what I call genomics 3.0, and it'll be used broadly across the entire spectrum of healthcare and planetary science. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic about um, devices and life science tools. And frankly, I'm a little scared about diagnostics. Um, until we get the clarity as to whether the LDT rule um, goes away and the new approach happens and Chevron doesn't get in the way, there are just, just one of the panelists said it this morning, investors hate surprises and they hate unknowns. So I think we, we have at least six months to get some clarity in diagnostics and then I think it takes off again. How about you? Uh, I find myself also gravitating towards the kind of cautiously optimistic sector. I, I worry a little bit, and it's kind of a, in, in allusion to a, uh, the question earlier, I, I do think we could have some consolidation in this industry as large large companies, large pharmas look to backfill their pipeline because they're under more pressure yes. on that because of the Inflation Reduction Act in particular and patent cliffs. I think some people are gonna be winners in that and that's gonna be great. Not everyone's gonna be able to be a winner. I do worry that you know we, end up creating too many losers and people get too risk averse and it ends up punishing people too much. We have to be able to, to fail, quite frankly, yeah. in this industry. And you know, that's, that's just something that you know, we, we don't wanna kinda shy away from the, the best science, the most aggressive uh, you know, goals in our treatment. Um, so I do worry a little, a little bit about that because uh, it just seems like there's gonna be a wave of consolidation. It's probably gonna toward, gravitate towards you know, de-risked assets, and, and, and that's, that's going to be a challenge. I think that's right. Maybe we, uh, I'll add one thing to that, because I think you said it so well. There have been more than 22 deals in 2024 alone of half a billion dollars or more, mostly therapeutics um, for about $38 billion in value. So people are getting out their checkbooks, which is you know, the only way that venture capitalists make money and all of you entrepreneurs make money is for your company to be sold. You can't depend on IPOs. So, should we let people get back to their emails? I suppose. <laughs> what do you think? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.